Count it all joy, chapter one, right? Count it all joy. It's the attitude in facing trials. Then he says that when you're facing trials, to pray for wisdom. We often pray for things. When you're facing trials, multicolored, multifaceted trials, pray for wisdom. And now we're in the latter part of the chapter, chapter one. If you turn there, if you don't have notes, make sure you get them because I'm going to cover a few things before we get there. Chapter one and verse nine. Will you turn me down just a little bit? Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. It flowers fall, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who he love. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Now, this is just an incredible passage. This passage is going to show us the process of sin how sin is conceived, understanding our struggle with sin and overcoming how to win against sin. That should be a book. Everybody say with me, how to win against sin. Now, if you don't have sermon notes and you want them, raise your hands because if you want to know this today, it would be good to have. I was told today, by the way, my sermon notes actually go to another church in another city and they take our notes each week and, and have a Bible study over the notes that I produce. So let's give the Lord a praise for that. Amen. That we're, we're reaching more than just Frankfurt. And even our videos, I get, I get uh, contact from people from other states, actually, uh, about our services. And we, we, we're going to raise money for a camera at some point. And we want to do it professionally and be able to do, even be on local TV at some point, uh, reaching our, our area. In your notes, I want to first talk about and lay a foundation or a background to be able to understand James a little bit clearer. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, if you don't have notes, turn in your Bible there. You might want to highlight that. But it says, now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Sanctification is the process where we become more like Christ. We're declared legally righteous before God, right? We're as righteous as we'll ever be. But we all know that we still sin. And sanctification is growing up spiritually. And may your whole, everybody say spirit, soul, and body. Be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, everybody look at me for just a few minutes. I am spirit. I have a soul or mind, and I have a body. This is the very foundational truth to understand how to be led by the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, how to walk in the Spirit, and how to grow up spiritually. Understanding the voices of our body. Uh, Reach over and gently pinch someone around you or pinch yourself. That is your flesh. It is decaying. Your flesh is dying. Your flesh is growing old. When you get born again, it is your spirit man on the inside that is born again. The Holy Spirit comes on the inside as a guaranteed. We're sealed. He's living on the inside of us when we're born again. Then we're filled with the Spirit. It is my spirit, man, that is born again. It is renewed day by day, but my flesh is dying. That's why I'm turning gray and my skin is wrinkling and all the things that we're, problems that we're having as we get older. Spirit, soul, and body. It is the mind that is between the two. The flesh is fallen. It's going, it's not going to be, it's not going to be renewed until Christ comes back. Until we receive, or, 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 or until we receive our glorified bodies. And my, but my spirit's born again. And my mind is in the middle. Mine's in the middle. Let's go to the next verse. Romans 12, 2. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If I say renew your mind. That you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, everybody put your hands up here. And say, my mind must be renewed. Don't be conformed. Now listen, the word conformed means to be assimilated into. Do not be assimilated into the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To win the battle over the flesh, I must renew my mind. The Bible says, well, to, how do I do that? Through the washing of the water of the word. Why is this so important to the life of the believer? One of the ways we overcome sin and become like Christ and sanctified is through the reading of the word of God. Don't be assimilated by the world, but be uh, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How am I transformed? By reading the Bible. This is your lifeline, church. This is Christ. When, when it's illuminated by the Holy Spirit, it's the bread of life. It's Christ to the believer. It makes me more like Jesus. It renews my mind. It lets me understand. Then the last one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. A stronghold is a lie that is believed. It's okay that I live in sin is a lie that's believed. Stronghold, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If I say knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity. Everybody say every thought. Put your hands back up here. Say my thoughts. Did you hear it say we're supposed to grab hold of what I'm thinking? My anger, my all the things that are, it, it, this war that's going on in our mind. And we're going to look at this in James now. James chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 9 in your notes. And he, 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 in the for, former passages he's talking about trial, or, or, uh, trials. And then he switches gears and he, he goes to something very unusual. He says this, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, let the poor, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flowers fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Folks, if you read the New Testament... And come away thinking that rich is a great thing. Being rich is just this incredible blessing. No, it's not. And here in this passage, we see this, this, this mindset. And I think to understand it, you need to understand the Jewish traditions. And the Old Testament prophets often railed against the rich. The rich would oppress the poor. To be poor was synonymous with having humility. Let me tell you, when you're poor, it's easy to be humble. When you're poor and you're eating beans and ramen noodles, it's easy to be humble and it's easier to trust God because you don't have all the distractions. When you're wealthy, you begin to think. I had a man one time tell me, well, I, I, you know, uh, I, I believe I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. It was my hard work that got me blessed. And I'm going to tell you right now, that man's ready for a fall. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? And so we see that, that this, what about Luke 6, 20? Blessed are the poor. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. I think the truth that is here, if you're going to write it down, is wealth will fade away, pursue the kingdom. Wealth is going to fade away, pursue the kingdom. Uh, is it wrong to have wealth? No. But make sure that you have the right priority in your wealth. Being wealthy should make you humble with the responsibility that God has given you to finance the kingdom. To bless the poor. To take care of others. When you are blessed financially, it comes with responsibility as a steward. And you will stand before God. Humble with your finances. Wealth should make you be more generous. Yet, if you look at the statistics, the wealthier you get, the stingier you become. But not here. 
I'm talking about other people. We have a very, we have a very generous church, and thank you so much. First James, uh, James chapter 12, I mean, verse 12. Blessed is the man, back to temptation here, who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I, I, I want to say that sin is easy. Saying yes to anger is easy. Saying yes to fornication is easy. Anybody can sin. When we leave here today and we, we're confronted with sin, we, we go to a restaurant and, and, and they give you $10 back, $10 too much. And you notice that it'd be easy to walk away and steal that money. Boyfriend and girlfriend alone by yourself. No one knows. It'd be easy to sin. It takes a man and a woman of God to stand up for what is right. It takes a, a man and a woman of God to do what is right. If you love me, obey me. Come on, can I get an amen? If you love me, obey me. And the word here says that if we endure, we receive the crown of life. For those of you that are struggling, I want to tell you the price of being righteous, the price of doing what is right is a reward, the crown of life. We re we're going to receive four crowns when we get to heaven. Are they literal crowns? I'm not sure. I don't know how four crowns would fit on my big head. But if I get my crowns, what's the purpose? Uh, one of the purposes is so that I can throw them at the feet of Jesus and worship him. This is about being faithful and faithful and faithful and faithful with each temptation again and again and again obeying the Lord. Enduring. Verse 13 in your notes. Verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now listen to this because I've heard, I guarantee you probably every person in this room has committed this sin. Every person in this room has been tempted with this sin. Let no one say, it's an imperative, which means it's command. Direct command to not blame God for your sins. Don't blame God for your sin. Oh, well, God, I got a ticket. I have a baby. My liver has cirrhosis. Oh, God. No, don't blame God for the results and the death of your sin and the problems that come with your sin. It's a command. Don't blame God. Well, what do we see that? Genesis 3.12. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, <laughs> she gave me the tree and I ate. I didn't do it, God. It's your fault. You gave me a woman. <laughs> Look at her. Wouldn't you listen to her too? Standing here naked with a tree and the apple, we're by ourselves in the garden in paradise. What else was I to do? It's your fault. You shouldn't have given her to me. We were perfectly fine, just you and me, God. Blaming God. And then, and then look at this, and look at this. And the Lord, God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The woman blames the serpent, the man blames God, and it continues on today. Blaming the devil and blaming God for sins that we've committed with free choice. Come on now, listen to me. Woo, this is good stuff. This is some good stuff. It's just going to get better. Your mind's getting ready to get blown. Go, psh. Come on, everybody go, psh. I'm going to blow your mind. The Bible's going to blow your mind. I'm not going to blow your mind. God's going to blow your mind. Somebody's going to get set free and transformed this morning. Amen. Come on. Then it goes on. To say, look, look, look at this. It says this. Let no one say commanded when he is tempted. 
And notice here it's in quotations. I am tempted. It's while being tempted. If you're being tempted right now, if you're in temptation and trial, right? Come on. While you're in the temptation, don't say that God is the one who is doing it. And the word by here is the word apo. It's a preposition and it means this, from far away. So we may not say, well, God is directly causing this sin. This sin. God's not directly causing it, but, but you shouldn't have put, God, you, you knew this was going to happen. Well, indirectly, you're, you're ultimately responsible for my sin, God. And, and, and James just says, no, command, no. God is not even indirectly from afar responsible for the problems and the sin that you are having. It is your fault. Come on, say amen. Oh, man, I know that's not real feel good. For God cannot be tempted by evil. God does not tempt because he cannot be uh, tempted. He's incapable of being tempted. The word here, uh, aparesto, cannot be tempted, untemptable, incapable of being tempted, impossible to tempt. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, transcendent, holy, other, magnificent God that we serve. And he cannot be tempted with evil. And he does not tempt. To tempt his creation would mean that he took pleasure in evil. And yet it is not found in him. God tempts no one. When you say... God, why would you do this to me? Why, God? I wonder how many people have said that. I know I, 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 in the bathroom, in the bathtub sometimes. Why, God? God didn't do it. It wasn't God that got you where you're at. Not God the one doing the tempting. So how are we tempted? James 1.14, look at this. But, everybody say But. <laughs> In other words, temptation does not come from God, but here's the process of sin. This is amazing. God doesn't tempt, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell you how, you get te- how, how it happens. But each one, when he is drawn by his own desires or lust and enticed, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Drawn away here is both used for hunting and fishing. It means to draw with force, to pull out. Now, I was going to set this trap. I decided I didn't want to break my finger in church. And I was going to snap a stick. And I thought, no, someone's going to, I'm going to set this. And uh, Alan's going to come up here and play with it. We're going to go to the hospital today. Or Pastor Bobby's going to break his finger. But what do we do with with the rat trap? We we set it. We put a little, little enticement there. We... The, the mouse, in his instincts, he comes by and he smells, right, he smells it. Something on the inside, even though he sees the trap and knows that something's not right. He smells, right? He, I know I'm not, I smell human on that. I know something's not right with this, but, oh, there's a piece of cheese on there. And I love cheese. Something on the inside draws him. The trap is set, it's baited. Satan is the one. He knows you. He, uh, you'll never face Satan. You'll face his, his minions, fallen angels, demons. Billy Graham is facing the devil. Other great men of God who have huge ministries over nations, he's, he's busy there. But he's sending his, his devils that we face. We have an enemy. Can I get an amen? And, and the enemy knows our desires, and he tempts us. And, and ladies, maybe it's in the mall. And, and you know you're not supposed to, your budget doesn't have the pair of shoes, but you go by and you go, I went to Simpsonville up there. Anybody know where been to Simpsonville? I was like, Lord have mercy. Oh, my goodness, I'm not going to bring my wife here. <laughs> no, actually, it's my little daughter, my, one of my, my 13-year-old. My, my wife doesn't, she's not a big shopper, but my 13-year-old loves to shop. She loves to shop. And, and, and I tell you, get her up there, she's like, <laughs> shoes and purses and, and pants and clothes. And, and you get up there and you know you shouldn't spend the money and you, and your flesh, drawn away, hunting. And then the second term here, this word entice, write it in your notes. That's why I leave the wide margin. Drawn away means it's a hunting term. Lured into a trap to be drawn by an inward power. That inward power for us is our fallen flesh. 
Let, let me, I, I didn't, I was going to tell you this early, but when my flesh has instincts, the instinct to procreate, have babies, is good, it's God in a marriage. When my, because my flesh is fallen, I am therefore enticed and drawn away to have sex out of marriage, to fornicate, and all the sexual sins. I have the desire, in, uh, uh, the instinct to nest, to build a home. But when perverted becomes hoarding and things, the lust for things. I have, I have the instinct to eat, to survive when, when, when perverted. You know, we struggle with that. Struggle with hamburgers and Cokes and Dr. Peppers. Are you with me? So it is my flesh and those fallen instincts, the perverted instincts that we're fighting. That's the inward force. The enemy is within. The traitor is within. Everybody wants to blame the devil, but it is your flesh that you're fighting. The devil sets the trap. But the Bible says, I've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. So as believers, we've been set free from sin, from, from the bondage of sin, from the slavery of sin. So we are free to walk in righteousness. Woo! Come on now. That's a good truth. You say, I want something deep. Well, that's deep right there. That's some deep, that's way deep. Way deep. Oh, it's deep. We've got some deep stuff. It's all in you. I thank God he doesn't tell. Then he, then he uses this term entice. Entice is a fishing term. I, I, I was going to bring a fishing pole, but, I, and I was gonna, but anyway. So I, I, love, I love to fish. I tell you, someone was saying that I didn't like. I love to fish. And, and, and you know, when I go fishing for trout, I, I, get a, uh, I do a uh, rooster tail, black and yellow rooster tail. Get on the Okoe River, and I, I toss it out. I'm getting the river, you know. I toss it out, and I reel it in real slow. Boom! Get a hit. When I'm tra- fishing for, for bass, I'll, I'll get a little bit of this stuff, power bait. And the word lure has to do with, oh, ugh. Really? <laughs> Come on now. I was trying to find some stink bait. Right? Well, that, you know what? The thing, what's interesting is in that passage, it says, by his own desires. Each one of us has different sins. Lust. Right? Uh, Chloe may really like shoes. Right? Right? Carrington may really like boys. Hopefully they both do. Not yet when they're older. Right? Alan really likes, you know, Alan really likes to buy guns, like so many guns. He just, just has thousands and thousands of guns. So what happens is the devil, he, he knows what the bait is, that he needs to draw by your lust and that smell. I know nobody here is going to want to suck this up or anything, but, right? Right, come on, Kevin. What, what do you do? You, when, I, when you fish for bass, you throw it out there, you know, you throw it out there and you let it sit. And the bass comes by and he <laughs> smells it. And that smell to him, by his own lust, he's drawn away to that. And he goes, sucks it in. You see the line draw out. Who entices the bait being put on the hook by the devil. Drawn is the hook being set. It's another word. It means to like to pull with force. Set the hook. My desires, my lust, as the devil puts them, brings them by us and sets the trap. He's luring us in with smells. You know, when you think about the commercials, the women and the cologne, they walk around and there's that trail and all the bit are like, right? Enticed. We are being enticed daily and, and that enticement will always be there. It will never go away. It will never go away. You will always have to put your flesh under, as Paul said, he's gonna, you have to beat your flesh. Well, what's great is James tells us how to beat it. <laughs> the rest of the process. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own unique lust, desires, and enticed. Enticed. So we have three enemies I want to talk about this morning. And, and we're going to just shift gears just a little bit. But first of all, we know Satan is our enemy. We have an enemy. Secondly, it's our flesh. Thirdly, the world. In 1 John 2, 15 through 16, do not love the world 
or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Mm. Guys, if you turn on TV and you see uh, sexual encounter after sexual encounter after sexual encounter and murder and violence and you love it, there is a problem. The world is fallen. Satan is the father of this world. The worldly system. That's why we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are in a different realm under God's rule. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. This is what James is talking about. That inward fallen instincts, the lust of the eyes. What is the lust of the eyes? It's when I see something, it triggers something in me. Be careful what you look. Guys, men, women, when you get home and you're sitting at your desk and you turn the lights off and, 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 you, and you, got the, you turn your TV or your computer screen where no one else can see and you have the clicker and you're shopping on Amazon or looking whatever you shouldn't be looking at or doing what it, that's the lust of the eyes. Be careful what you are looking at. And if you have a problem with one of those things, block it on your internet so you do not have access. Get a software that protects you and your family for what your eyes can see. Be careful what you watch on TV. It's the world trying to entice you. It's like as Eve looking at the fruit. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What's the pride of life? It could be education. I'm better than others. Self-righteousness. Anything that has to do uh, with success without God. That's not focused on God and his kingdom. Look at Eve in, in Genesis 3, 6. Here's what we see. The woman saw the tree. It was good for food. That was lust, physical desire. It was pleasant to the eyes. It looked, it looked good. It looked pretty. It was Gucci. It was a Gucci apple. <laughs> and, a, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Oh, I'm going to be smarter than God or smart as God. James 1.15, we see the rest of this process. Look at this. And we're, we're, we're still good. It's just 11.30. We're going to beat the Baptist to the, to the buffet. Don't worry. We got spaghetti today. Right. $2 and $5. Please support the mission team. Verse 15, then when desire or lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So we see the process here. We're, 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 the trap is set. We're, we bite the hook. Then when desire or lust has conceived, where, does it, where is it conceived? It's conceived in the mind and in the will. It goes from my from my feelings, from my emotions to the mind and the will. It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Now, Lauren is getting ready to have a baby. Baby was conceived. And once it's conceived, the process just goes on and on. I'm hot. Is anybody else hot? I am sweating. Lauren decides, oh, well, I, I don't want this baby. Guess what? It's coming. It's coming when that baby wants to come. It's conceived. It's growing. It's going to birth. It's going to happen in God's time. Amen. And when we have that, when we're drawn off, it moves from the emotion to the mind. And then from the mind to the will where I decide, am I going to serve God or am I going to obey Christ or am I going to think on these things? Am I going to cast down imaginations? Am I going to take hold of this thought and refuse to think it? That's where it comes back to. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. Renew your mind so that you don't go ahead and sin. The battle is in the mind. The battle is in the will. That's why I need, I hope that at the end of this you can understand how important before we act upon it. As, the, as our flesh is, is struggling, once we begin to think upon it, we need to have the, 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 the biblical fortitude and the, and the spiritual maturity to take a hold of those thoughts and stop it 
It stops in the mind. James 1.16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived. Stop blaming God. Stop blaming the devil. Renew your mind. Look at this in verse 17 and 18. As we get ready to close. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Everybody say, God is good. Devil is bad. Everybody say, God is good. Devil is bad. In other words, why why would you want to sin? Why would you want to let it conceive? Why let it birth? Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Word of truth by his, by the word of truth, the Bible. That we might be kind of a first fruits of his creation. God cannot produce sin. God pours out blessings. God is all you need, folks. Come on, say, God is all I need. Man, when we're struggling in life and temptations, God is all I need. Dad, as you're struggling and supporting your family and temptations come, God is all you need. As the devil tries to set the trap and lure you off through the lust of your flesh, God is all you need. Renew your mind through the washing of the water of the word is how you defeat sin. That's how you win against sin is through reading the Bible and walking in it and applying it. I want to give you one more promise this morning before we close. Get the band to come up. Or... <clears throat> As I was studying about the giving birth, I'm thinking, oh, Lauren's going to have that baby today. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has taken you but such is common to man. But God who is faithful. I'm going to say God who's faithful. Will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. But will with the temptation make a way of escape. That you may be able to bear it. I wonder as you bow your heads this morning. As they begin to play. I wonder if you've fallen into sin. I wonder if you're struggling with temptation.